Hey, voice okay? Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, the subtitle of this uh, topic uh, is whether we're asking a sensible question when we raise the issue of early intervention or intensive therapy. Um, and I'm gonna try to provoke you a little bit um, if I can get the slides to work. Yes, I can. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I like to talk about the idea of what is the question and I call this WTQ. Um, and when people ask a question uh, about a topic or if they ask what measure to use or things like that, I always wanna know what's behind the question because without that, uh, we might be giving a very good answer to the wrong question. Um, so the question with respect to early intervention is what we're trying to achieve or any intervention quite frankly and to think about the guiding concepts and the end results that are driving what we're doing so that there's a rationale for it. And I think that's always important so that we know we're on the same page with one another, so that we know we're on the same page with a family. Um, and so I'm gonna to try to offer some perspectives on how some of us are reconsidering these challenges based upon changes that are happening in the field and uh, changes that are happening outside the field that are, be, that, that are influencing how we think about what it is we do in childhood disability and in child development more broadly. And I hope that some of the things I say will challenge you and that you will in turn ask questions and challenge me because if you're going to be uh, polite, you're going to uh, challenge me. And I mean that seriously. I need to hear what things I say either don't make sense or irritate people so that I can be ready for the next presentation. So if we start with looking at some of the traditional assumptions of, of our field, um, we've been trained, and I say we meaning all of us as health professionals, uh, whatever our particular discipline is, we've been trained to think about neurodisability in a particular way. We spend a lot of time working on a diagnosis and finding the right treatments. And the question, the rhetorical question, is whether there's research evidence to support this particular approach as opposed to other approaches that I'll talk about. And then the, the sort of corollary is whether there are other ways to think about the neurodisabilities or the neurodevelopmental impairments that are part of our day-to-day -day work, uh, both how to think about the conditions and how to think about what we do and how we approach them, how we work with families. And again, ask whether there's research evidence to support what I'm suggesting. So if we start by looking back at where we've come from, um, our traditional beliefs include the idea that we're engaged in pediatric rehabilitation. And I would say that that's not the way we are, we should be thinking. Uh, rehabilitation is what I need after my stroke. Rehabilitation for kids is not returning them to function. If we're talking about early childhood onset conditions, what we're really trying to do is to promote child and family development and functioning. And if we think about our field where we work in the field of developmental disability and we then forget the first word, we talk about developmental disability because we're talking about conditions that either do or might put a child at risk of having problems in their development. So a high risk neonate, for example, uh, may be at risk for developmental issues. A child with cerebral palsy, a child with a vision impairment, a child with a communication deficit, a child with uh, autism, all those children are at, at important risk of having a different kind of development. And we need to think much more about development than we have traditionally done apart from being concerned that the children aren't meeting milestones. The second thing is we've been trained in a biomedical model, and I said this in the previous slide, make the diagnosis and provide the right treatment. And I think you will all agree that the alphabet soup of conditions that we talk about, and I'll say this a bit more about this in a minute, none of these is a specific diagnosis. These are all descriptions. 
um, they're not diseases in the way that kidney failure is a disease that requires a um, renal dialysis or a renal transplant, which is a disease-oriented treatment for a disease. These are all developmental conditions. And I hate to say it, but none of the treatments that we do is specific to cerebral palsy or autism or ADHD. And that's different from the treatment that I will get in the emergency room if I'm having a heart attack. A specific intervention will, will bust up the clot that is blocking my coronary artery. That is a very specific treatment for a specific uh, condition. And the point is that we have imported biomedical ideas from acute care into our field, and they don't really work very well. I think they've interfered with our thinking. And then the related issue is the treatment should start with the impairment, what's not working in the body. And the reality is that almost all our treatments address signs and symptoms and not the causes. Now, some of you work with kids with cerebral palsy, so what about Botox? Well, Botox clearly you know, works to interfere with muscle trans with the neuromuscular transmission. But that's not about cerebral palsy. That's about neuromuscular transmission. And it's useful in, in cerebral palsy and in lots of other situations. It's not a cerebral palsy specific intervention. We've traditionally aimed our therapies at managing impairments like spasticity and range of motion. And there's good research evidence to show that we can indeed change the impairment, but that often does not lead to a change in functioning. And one of my colleagues who did her PhD as, a, as a, an adult, uh, uh, an experienced therapist, Virginia Wright, uh, showed this beautifully. You can make major changes in body structure and function with range of motion and Ashworth scales and so on, but that does not lead to changes in functioning. Now, there may be reasons to try to change spasticity, but we can't just assume that we start at the top and work down. And then one of my favorite ones is the whole notion of normal. Normal movement and motor control are our goals. And I'm gonna say lots more about normal. I think it's a strange idea. I think it's an idea we should get rid of altogether. We can't produce normal. We don't even know what the hell we're talking about, quite frankly. And that variation is the spice of life. And we need to recognize and accept variation and not be so strict with respect to what some notion of normal is. So we've been taught that biomedical interventions and treatments can fix medical problems. And certainly they can fix my, my blocked coronary artery if you give me the right treatment at the right time. But in our field, we don't fix very much. The second notion that is part of our belief system is that normal is the correct approach. The third assumption is that service providers are experts, and we are experts as far as it goes. We're experts in the conditions, but the parents are the experts in their child and in their family and in their uh, values and views of life, and we need to recognize that when we're working collaboratively with them. So our classic assumptions about diagnose and treat are limited in terms of their applicability. So I'm not saying they're wrong, I just don't think they take us where we need to go, particularly with chronic conditions. And the tyrannies are, as I said earlier, that normal uh, is, is the goal. And of course, if you're not normal, what are you? Uh, and I think that abnormal is a really weird idea. Um, if you, if you think about a modern example of this, there used to be two sexes, uh, male and female, and now we have more than two. So why the hell are we still stuck on normal and abnormal? Um, it's a binary idea, and I just don't think it makes much sense. The focus on diagnosis is the key to services. Think about all the effort we put into test, testing kids and doing a whole variety of evaluations, and there is a place for that but there's a kind of uh, mania for making the diagnosis when we also need to recognize, and I say 1975 because that's when Barry Pless and Philip Pinkerton published a book about the issues to make the point that a non-categorical uh, approach, diagnoses are categories, thinking across categories, 
this is really important. There's lots of research evidence to show that the amount of variation within cerebral palsy or spina bifida or autism is much bigger than the mean variation across these conditions in terms of impact on child development, impact on family, and so on. And so we need to recognize the limitations of focusing on diagnosis before we can take action. And that leads us to challenge the idea that in addressing impairments is the way to go or is the only way to go. Uh, and most of the evidence you know, argues that. So let's try to suggest that some things are changing in the world and that we're thinking differently now. And I'm, not, I'm, I'm going to talk about some things that we want to apply to our field, but they aren't necessarily coming from child development. This uh, a quote from Huber from uh, 2011, I think is a really interesting one. Health is the ability to adapt and self-manage in the face of social, physical, and emotional challenges. Um, you can ponder that if you like, but I think what it's telling us is that functioning is evidence of health. And if you buy that idea, then we need to put a lot of emphasis on helping kids with challenges in their functioning to function the best way they can, even if they do it differently. What else is changing? Our ideas about what we call developmental disability. And I said this a minute ago that most of the conditions that we're interested in are not diseases. They have a biological underpinning which we may or may not recognize. If we have a prem baby who has periventricular leukomalacia, we can say, okay, the, <clears throat> it is the damage to the long tracks uh, that is in effect causing the, the motor impairment, um, but we're not gonna fix those. And we don't need a disease care system for those. And very often we have no idea what's going on. I don't think we know much about what's going on under the surface in kids with autism in many kids with developmental and uh, intellectual disability. And in any, even if they have an underlying condition, we don't really have a way of treating what has caused the condition. And I said this a minute ago, and I'll just emphasize the point about the alphabet soup. I have a, a colleague in Minnesota who says that we use labels as uh, he said, he calls them adjectives parading as nouns. And if you look back, if those of you who uh, are interested, there's a very fascinating and disturbing book called Asperger's Children, written a, a year or two ago. And when Asperger in the late 1930s was describing what became known as Asperger's syndrome, he talked about ch these children being autistic with a small a as an adjective. And Canner, in 1943, when he first described what became known as, as autism, he also used the word as an adjective. And then we put a capital letter on it and suddenly it's a thing. Intellectual disability is a description, um, but when we put a capital I and a capital D, suddenly it's a category. And I think we need to recognize these are descriptive labels that may have some utility, but cannot be used to guide our interventions just by themselves. So what else is changing? I said this already, the non-categorical way of thinking and recognizing what are common issues across developmental disabilities. And why this is so important is because parents have a lot to share with one another. But unless we help them recognize that, they think that their child's situation is unique. And sadly, a lot of our colleagues think the same way. You know, you sit down at lunch with, uh, at an empty table and somebody comes along and you kind of recognize them and they ask if the place is uh, free and they sit down and you ask them what they do. And then they tell you they work with condition ABC and these are the most complicated kids in the world. And then somebody else comes along and they work with kids with uh, D condition DEF and their kids are the most complicated kids in the world and so on. And my sarcastic comment is these are people who don't get out enough. 
because the things that they're talking about are really the same things. But because we work in the Prater Willie clinic or in the spina bifida clinic or in the autism clinic, we think that what we're seeing is unique. And it's important, and each family situation is unique, but the issues are not. The other thing that we're learning, uh, and it's taken a hell of a long time to learn it, is that all the children we see will grow up to be adults with the same conditions. Um, so children with, with autism grow up to be adults with autism, and children with cerebral palsy grow up to be adults with cerebral palsy. And because all of us in, in the audience today work with kids, we don't tend to think about a life course approach. But there's more and more interesting work being done to look at the adult lives of these former children. And as we learn things about their lives from them, from their families, and so on, it's influencing how we think about our work with one-year-olds and two-year-olds and three-year-olds and their families. And we're also learning to accept and celebrate diversity and variation. And that's in general in the community. Now, there's still lots of political issues there, but I think there is more uh, acceptance of, di of diversity than there used to be. So the framework that uh, was compelling to me in the 1980s was the World Health Organization's framework for, called the International Classification of Impairments, Disabilities, and Handicaps. I'm only going to say one sentence about it, which is this is the framework that you had a disease, that a disease was associated with impairments or problems in the body, which in turn limited function called disability, which in turn had social consequences called handicap. Now this was useful because it reminded us of these components of a health condition, but it had a lot of limitations, not the least of which is the kind of slippery slope that's implied by the unidirectional arrows. And in 2001, after 20 years of a good deal of international discussion, including with people with, with disabilities, the World Health Organization came out with what's now called the ICF, the International Classification of Functioning, Disability, and Health. And while the noun in the, in the title is classification, ignore the classification and look at the next slide, which is this framework. And if I were in the room, I would ask you, I, before I show the slide, I would have asked how many people knew the ICF. I hope all of you do. And if some of you don't, then hooray, because you're learning something new today. This, is, this has been around for almost 20 years and is a really interesting way to think about health conditions. And I put CP and autism on the top because that's those are the kinds of kids we work with, but you could equally have Alzheimer's disease or diabetes or heart disease. Any health condition in this concept has manifestations in body structure and function at the biological and psychological level. It, that condition might interfere with activity or day-to-day, -day, uh, what I call the ING words of life, there may be impacts on participation or engagement in life in ways that are meaningful to the person who has that condition. And now we can no longer, when I mention environmental factors and personal factors, everybody says, oh yeah, we know that. And I say rude things, including uh, you don't actually pay attention to them. What you're telling me is you understand the word environment and you understand the word personal factors, but now in this framework, we are expected to pay attention to them. And environmental factors are obviously the physical, the, the, the uh, human environment, the political environment, the social environment. There is a whole host of environments that influence our lives every day and are particularly important uh, in the lives of kids with impairments and their families. And the NDIS is a very powerful example of an environmental factor that is leading all of you and to some extent us in Canada as well to think about these issues differently. Uh, and then personal factors. What floats your boat? What's important to you as the person who has the condition? Now, what we like about this is the language, which is now neutral instead of disability and handicap. We like the fact that these are all connected to each other, which means that we're now talking about an organic system, a dynamic system, to coin a phrase that you all know. Um, and now we can recognize that we can intervene anywhere and everywhere. 
without having to start with body structure and function and then hope that that'll change activity and so on. So this is really a powerful framework. Now, I think what's interesting is to look at, to, to recognize that when we are uh, told or asked to look at something, we often see what we're looking for. So I want to show you a picture of a beautiful young woman with a feather hat looking over her right shoulder. And I hope you can all see her, right? Can anyone see the old woman? Yes? You see the nose, and you see the mouth, and you see her eye and her eyelash, instead of the beautiful young woman. But because I told you to expect something, it's not surprising that you, what, that's what you uh, then saw. And so what I wanna show you is the way in which we've been thinking about, uh, about these ideas over the last few years. And uh, my wife coined the phrase, I see F words. Um, and I don't know why the hell we didn't think of it, but you know, there it is. And this is now the ICF in child development with the F words that we have picked as examples to illustrate what we might be interested in and ought to be interested in when we're working with kids with impairments and their families. So when to talk, and we're not saying these are the only important things but we talk about body structure and function and we emphasize fitness because that's not traditionally been something we've thought about when we're working with kids with impairments. When we talk about activity, which and the words in brackets are the ICF words, we talk about function. We don't say nice function, normal function. We talk about function. When we come to part when we talk about participation, we talk about friendships. When we talk about personal factors, we, we refer particularly to fun. And when we talk about environment, we refer particularly to family because these we see as central concepts encapsulated within the ICF, but in a way that we think brings the ICF to life. At the bottom, you'll see the green arrow for future. And pardon me, we emphasize future because of course, children are a work in progress. And the whole purpose of well, I shouldn't say that that way, but the challenge of parenting is to help our kids, you know, get through childhood and become independent adults, all our kids. And future is not, part, time is not part of the ICF framework. So we put this in to remind people that we should always be thinking about what is the impact or what is the potential impact of what we're doing now for tomorrow and next week and next year. And as I said earlier, the lessons we're learning from adults with impairments uh, is uh, quite sobering when it comes to how important therapy was. Um, <laughs> and I won't tell you the answer, but you can imagine. Um, so this is, this is a, a way, a graphic that we put together. Uh, the, the actual cartoons were done by colleagues in Australia at the World Cerebral Palsy, um, uh, World Cerebral Palsy Day. Uh, they asked our permission to develop this, and we said yes, as long as our parents could look at it. And so these cartoons simply illustrate the words that we have um, uh, put together. And by putting it, putting the cartoons and the F words in with the ICF, we hope people can recognize the integration of these two concepts. And these are not for cerebral palsy. They're not for autism. They're for child development. Um, and, um, you know, we, what we're finding is that lots of people say, wow, this is really interesting. Uh, they really never did think about it this way before. Um, so the F words, we like the F words because we appreciate the ICF as a framework for health for everybody, including all the people in the audience and the people talking. I like to think about this set of concepts as a strengths-based approach. And in medicine, and probably in all the other disciplines, we're taught to rule out, to think, you know, could it be this? Well, let's do the test. No, it isn't this, that we rule it out. I like to think about the ICF framework as a rule in, where we are bringing into the story the strengths, the capacities, the abilities, and so on, across the various dimensions. 
and creating a picture that is quite different from the usual. When I lecture, and if I were standing in front of you, I probably would have introduced myself as a non-Asian, non-woman. Um, and you would have wondered what was wrong with Denise to get this idiot to come and talk to you. Um, and I think if you could see me in person, you'd recognize that I probably am a non-Asian, non-woman, but that would tell you nothing about me. And I caricature that because so much of our traditional approach has been the catalog of doom. Identify all the things the child is having trouble with. And there is a place for that, but there is equally, and I would argue more powerfully, a place for identifying the strengths. So the F words, as I said, are our effort to bring the ICF concepts to life in a practical and easily understood set of concepts. And we have lots and lots of evidence that this is really catching on all over the world. So we can talk about this and if you don't like them, that's fine. They're, they're free and worth every penny, but they seem to be attracting a lot of attention. Um, so if we explore these ideas, I want to show you just a few illustrations from one of the parents who's a member of our F Words research group. She's a parent of a, 16, a now 16 year old boy with level five cerebral palsy, quite a bright boy who uses augmentative devices, augmentative mobility and augmentative communication. And what she's done is to uh, not only adopt these ideas, but be a very powerful um, presenter about them. And if she were here, uh, I'd let her do all the talking uh, with her Serbian accented English, which is especially delightful. Uh, so this is a picture of Vasily a few years ago, and they go to Serbia every summer uh, where he can be with his uh, maternal grandparents. His grandfather, who's a retired engineer, uh, is a beekeeper. And um, he, he asked Vasily if Vasily was interested in beekeeping, and Vasily's interested in everything. So his grandfather kitted him out, and they do, the, and Vasily has some of his own hives that he looks after with help. Um, but that's just so cool. Is Vasily an independent beekeeper? No. Is Vasily a beekeeper? Yes. He probably knows more about bees than many of the people uh, in the audience right now. So a little bit of adaptation. Functioning, how things are done is not so important. So here's Vasily a few years ago on the right playing ping pong with his grandfather. Um, and, you know, he's engaged in this activity. Apparently he gets screaming crazy excited when they do this. Um, could he do it on his own? No. Does it matter? No. Um, when we look at, I've already said this and I won't beat it to death, but here's Vasily with his grandparents, here's Vasily with his uh, brother and his cousins and, uh, and so on, here's Vasily with his cat, and what's important to him is family, hugely important. In fact, I can tell you, because I do a lot of work with his mom, that his grandparents Skype in every afternoon and talk with Vasily. They live in Serbia, he lives in Hamilton, Ontario, near Toronto. So family is huge to him. Fitness, he does horseback riding with help, he does sledge hockey, uh, Canadian thing, of course. Um, he uh, plays soccer, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. He was very keen to do zip lining, and his mother in yellow at the top with a helmet uh, hates heights, got up there, tells a very funny story about getting him into his harness and then turning around to go back. And they told her, no, you can't go back. And so she had to go down the zip line. She was terrified, <laughs> but she did it because it was important to Vasily. Wasn't her idea. Um, fun, doing things. Um, the, the picture on the right is from another family with whom we work, a family in the UK. Um, and, you know, if you look carefully, you can see somebody W sitting, so you can probably figure out which kid has cerebral palsy. But here he is with some other kids having fun. Now, this video, unfortunately, doesn't work. But Vasily plays uh, uh, adapted uh, soccer. He's, he's from Serbia. He's from that part of the world where soccer is, is mania. Uh, and this video shows him learning to do headers, and it is screamingly funny. His mom's helping him, of course, but he's doing the headers, and he is scr screaming with laughter and excitement. Um, and it, it's just to make the point that why not? Why not try things that are important to, to a child? 
So friends, obviously important in all sorts of ways. Uh, and this, from most parents, is the biggest challenge. What Daniela tells is that she tells the story of inviting the kids in Vasili's class to his birthday party. They come to his birthday party, but he never gets invited back. And that is a challenge that we all have to recognize <clears throat> that kids with impairments have real trouble often in making friends and keeping friends. And then this is Daniela's comment, the future is now. Tomorrow is what I make of today. I don't want opportunities to pass me by, help me achieve what I can today. Is Vasily ever gonna be a professional beekeeper? No. Is he ever going to be a soccer player? No. Does that matter? No. And I can't remember when I was there a few years ago whether I tried this on, but uh, I often ask how many people play tennis and lots of hands go up. And then I ask how many people play professionally and you, that usually elicits a laugh. And then I say, why do you bother? And my point is simply that we don't have to do things in order to be incredibly good at them. We do things for a host of reasons. And I think that because of impairments, we're so acculturated to thinking about things having to be done nicely and normally that we forget that it is the doing that's important, not necessarily the quality of the doing. Those of you who are good tennis players probably are good tennis players because you have a passion for it. You probably practice a lot. You may take lessons. Um, and those of us who just go out and hit a ball occasionally and don't really care how well we do aren't as good. But the people, the things we do well are things we do because they're important to us. And I think that's important for kids. The F words video, this is a cartoon video that was made by colleagues in uh, Brazil. And it's a three minute cartoon and you can find it on the Canchild website. It's worth looking at. This is the English version of it. We liked it so much in the Portuguese with subtitles that we asked them for permission to make an English version of it. And this is the same uh, video in English. It's just lovely. And it's something you might want to show to families uh, or to show to your colleagues who wonder what the heck you're talking about when you say F words. Um, and then we have this poster, which we've now replaced with the one I showed you, but this poster, uh, the one on the left was developed uh, by our colleagues in Australia with us. And now we have, I think, 25 translations. And we have not done the translations. People write to us and say, can we have the video, or can, sorry, can we have the poster in our language? I think this is the Georgian language from the, uh, the country, Georgia. Um, and they do the translation, keep the cartoons, so there's a commonality to it. And obviously in other languages, they're not F words, but they're maybe favorite words. Um, so the uptake of these ideas has been enormous. Now, I wanna talk about another way in which we're thinking differently now. Some of you may know that in 1988, uh, a study was published in the New England Journal of Medicine from Johns Hopkins by Fred Palmer and his colleagues. And it was a randomized clinical trial of NDT therapy as practiced in the mid eighties and compared to an early intervention program. And briefly the design was that the kids aged 12 to 19 months with diplegic CP were randomized to receive either NDT for six months or an early intervention learning games program for six months. They were assessed at the beginning, they were assessed at six months, and then after that, for the second six months of this year-long trial, everybody got NDT. And this was done, I think, in order to establish you know, how excellent NDT was. Well, the results at six months and 12 months showed the opposite. The kids in the learning games program did better at six months and 12 months on virtually everything. And the, re the reason for bringing this up is because people said, oh, gee, that's disappointing. We expected more from NDT. Nobody said, what the hell's going on here? Nobody said, how come these kids did well? And nobody thought about what I believe we are now much more interested in, which is, so-called early intervention that allows kids and empowers kids and encourages kids to get on with doing things even if they don't do them nicely. 
there was, for those of you who are old enough, uh, a lot of concern in the NDT world and possibly elsewhere uh, with kids having an ugly gait, being in a crouch gait, knees uh, internally, hips internally rotated, being up on their, on their toes and so on. And the tension that exists between preventing that and empowering mobility and development is an interesting tension. But it seems as though the kids who were allowed to get on with it developed better. Um, and I think that's a really important message. Uh, and again, we saw the glasses half empty because we had a particular expectation. Um, another example is some work that our colleague, that my colleagues and I have done, I, I'm a small part of it, uh, with uh, learning lessons from young adults with cerebral palsy. And again, they are talking about what's important to them and none of the things that's important to them is how nicely they do things. What's important to them is having friends, having intimate partner relationships, having a job, being independent. And none of it is about the things that we have traditionally focused on in our early intervention. And then uh, this is a paper by Bob Palisano and Sue Muir, uh, and I put the reference here so that you can look at the paper yourself, but they also reflected on these issues and talked about the various considerations with respect to the intensity of therapy. And so intensity itself is not the point. What's important, as they identify it, is the readiness for the activity and so that the therapies that are being given are, are addressing activity and participation, how services are delivered, and so on. The distinction between intensity of therapy and practice of activity in natural environments. We traditionally assess kids with, with mobility problems in the clinic on a, on a floor that is smooth but not too slippery. We move the furniture out of the way and we look at what is, in effect, the child's capacity. And then we find out that when they're in school, they're using a walker and we're disappointed. Well, what we've traditionally failed to recognize is that different environments require us to use different methods or may require us to use different methods to do things. I don't know where you are today in the building, but if you're on the third floor of a building and some of you took the elevator, I might challenge you as to why you took the elevator or the escalator when you're perfectly capable of walking. The environment imposes certain things on us, and we tend not to think about those. Um, so coming back to the question, uh, I've tried to reframe the issue by asking, what's the question? What are the goals that we have with respect to either early intervention or intensive therapy? And of course, intensive therapy is perhaps how we do early intervention. But in, er, intensive therapy by itself is just a, a description of how much we're doing relative to typical. We always have to know whose goals uh, are at play here. And we have to be careful not to tell parents what their goals should be because those are our goals. And we have to be able to reframe parents' goals. When the parent says, I want my child to walk and that child has level four cerebral palsy, we can say, I mean, what, and many people will say, well, we need lots and lots of therapy. But I think those of us who are honest would say, that's not a good answer. And a better answer would be, first of all, what do you want your child to do when they can walk? And if the parent says, I want to be able to explore and get into mischief, we can say, okay, we can facilitate that. And there are ways of doing that with wheels that will allow the child to do exactly what you just asked for, which is have independence and get into mischief. But therapy, and for a ch physical therapy for a child like that, is really uh, not intellectually honest. And we have to think about the underlying assumptions that we're making. Are we trying to fix the underlying biomedical problem? Or are we trying to enhance child development? And those are often, as I've tried to suggest, really sub substantially different. And so if we refocus on the World Health Organization's ideas about health and functioning, we might come up with different answers or certainly different questions. A um, couple of parent quotes, you will gather information from reports, testing and individual educational program goals. And this will give you an invaluable insight into my son's needs. 
For a fuller picture of my awesome child, however, I would like to present you with the following document from my child about my child. And she goes on then to use some of our F words materials that have been created by parents. Um, this is a, a picture from three years ago at World CP Day and uh, with a panel <clears throat> of young people and, and the parent, the lady in blue, second from the right, uh, who's the parent I was talking about. And they had been talking about what the F words meant to them. And uh, a couple of days later, my colleague who hosted this meeting sent me this message from a parent. My entire approach to raising my son has shifted from one of fixing to a wellness approach by embracing the F words. I feel very empowered and have reor reoriented my goals to reflect this paradigm shift. This was spontaneous from the parent. She has a child who's significantly impaired and she was prepared to rethink what she was trying to achieve and how she could be helpful to her child. So if you go to the Can Child website and go to the F words knowledge hub, you will find a vast number of things with uh, videos, parent resources, uh, F words tools, and so on that you may find very helpful. And uh, it's all there for you to, uh, for free. Um, and uh, I suggest you have a look if you're interested. So if these ideas have uh, created some anxieties, now's your chance to uh, let me know. <laughs> okay. Fifteen minutes or so for some discussion. <coughs> we would like to <coughs> ask if there's questions. Is your hand going up? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Hi, my name is Vivian Pavlos. We met in Melbourne a few years ago at the participation conference. Thank you so much for um just love it. Um the ICF. The way that I've drawn it in my research is to put a bubble around the whole thing and in the background have mental well-being. That's for my adolescents. So that, that well-being side of it is, um, it, yeah, it, it's in there as well. And I love how you put future in because the ICF is really just a snapshot of one point in time. So I, I love yeah. it. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Can I ask you whether you've shown this to parents and used it with, with parents and families? Absolutely. So um, I've, I've got the young people with neuromuscular conditions in transition to adulthood. Um, so in the yeah, the way I question them, I give them the ICF as a background to um, as a um, like a one page summary of where they're at, and we fill in each box of the ICF to ask them where their priorities are. Yes. That's cool. One of the things that, that we've learned from the parents is not only that parents, and we this started with a therapist whose idea this was, and all the stuff that we have on our website that isn't ours is attributed to the people who are smart enough to think of them. Um, so uh, one of our therapist colleagues uh, in another center started using um, uh, the F words as a basis for a discussion with families about what their goals might be. And what somebody else then said after a while, okay, here's the goal, but also why? which is really interesting. Okay, the goal is such and such. Why is that the goal? Because again, the, the, we're not going to argue with your goal, but we may have different ways to approach that if we understand why that goal is important to you. Anybody else? Don't be so polite. <laughs> Peter, can I ask one that might, um, uh, might be useful? So if you had a family, uh, as you know, we have the NDIS. If you had a family who came uh, to you and um, they'd been told that they needed lots of therapy and more therapy basically was better, um, how would you approach or start that conversation uh, with them? Because often that information comes from people that they respect, often a pediatrician or others in the, um, you know, in the medical field or allied health field that have, um, you know, set them on that journey, I guess. And it, yep. it appears that often the first thing parents hear or they, you know, see with other families is what they feel is the correct way and what they should be, um, they should be doing. And so it's often quite challenging to then try to, um, have a conversation that might steer them in a different direction with the, with the yeah. child. 
Well, the, the answer, I'll give the short answer and then refer to the long answer for another day. The short answer is, as I said earlier, I'd like to know from the parents what they're hoping for. What are their, what are their goals, you know, for this week and this month? What are they, where do they want this all to go? And to help them understand some of the tensions and the dilemmas that I referred to in this talk and that most people uh, recognize, um, if we do therapy eight hours a day, that's eight hours that we're not doing something else. That's one, that would be one comment. Another comment would be that therapy is, can, can be the things that technical, uh, that require technical skills. Uh, and therapy can be things that we build into our day in ways that are um, consistent with what else is going on. I would want to talk to them about how, how important child development is. I would want to tell them that we're thinking differently about things than we used to. I would want to tell them that it's really important that kids have as much active engagement in life as possible and that passive therapy lots of movement of the of the limbs and stretching and so on doesn't work as well as kids doing things on their own um, and i would say that you know there's research to support this um, and you know we need we may need some time it may take more than one conversation i mean i can give a talk for 45 minutes and people in the audience can at least you know process it whether they agree with it or not is another question uh, but for parents who are new to this this is all new and i would want to see this i would see this as a process where we would try to explain these things the longer answer is that uh, i'm involved with colleagues uh, in melbourne brisbane uh, and in, in canada with a funded study uh, called envisage which in which we're trying we're exploring the introduction of some of the ideas i've uh, presented here in a more formal way to families of preschoolers with any kind of neurodisability to see whether produce presenting these ideas to parents and having them engaged in discussion about them in changes and enhances their understanding of childing uh, parenting and so on um, I don't think this is something you can do by picking up a, a, a paper and reading it uh, but I think the conversations that we can have would allow us to present parents with ideas that are more modern than the advice they've been given. They've been given advice by good people. I'm not critical of my colleagues who say you need lots and lots of therapy. My colleagues who are saying that and your colleagues who are saying that are people who aren't as immersed in the field as we are and aren't necessarily up to date with the changing thinking the changing evidence of research and so on. So among the responsibilities and opportunities we have is to share these ideas with those well-meaning colleagues to say, don't send us families and ask us to fix them. Send us families with the idea that we're going to help the family become effective parents around issues that are more challenging for this child than for others. <coughs> Um, hi, Peter. My name is Bernadette Robinson. I'm a physiotherapist um, working in a child development center, and I've worked with kids with disabilities of uh, various conditions for over 35 years. And um, I just love this, what you just said, the whole approach. And um, what it reminded me is um, because I see mostly kids with delay, and Probably per year, I get between five and ten children which end up having an, or being diagnosed with a disability. And my big finding is that uh, when I see the kids with a disability, I really follow your map, sort of the you know the family, the functioning. And when I have the delay kids, I'm more um, I'm looking more into quality. So for example, like all the kids who can't chew, like I really have to get a good transportation to get the lateral trunk movement. And, and this is in the delay kids. And I have to be really fussy with that. But then I, when I go to, to the kids more with disability long term, I'm, I'm having a totally different approach. It doesn't make sense what I just said though. Um, why is it a different approach? 
it's not different approach. I think I talk to them in the same way, but I'm just more because I'm trained in um, um, like I'm over trained from Europe, but I'm also trained in psychomotoric and, and learning games. So I'm really have a strong focus of that and my and I'm very um, advocate for attachment and infantile health. So but I noted that I have to work slightly different with the delay versus the disability. I, I, <clears throat> clearly we, we should we need to have a longer conversation than is possible right now. But, but one of but one of my questions would be um, and I, I want to know when I first meet a family, my first question to them is, what do you want to brag about? Yeah, yeah. And I tell them, if you're not going to brag, go home. I don't want to see you. Yeah. And about 95% of families are just so delighted because nobody's ever asked them. 5% of the families think you're a fruitcake. Mm -hmm. But the second question is, what have you been told your child won't be able to do? And how many of us have seen kids who weren't supposed to walk and talk, walk into clinic and say, hi, remember me? You know, and I, what, what I'm getting at there is that our ability, and I blame doctors in particular, for being arrogant enough that we can predict. We're not good at predicting. And as I always say to parents, the kids never listen anyway. So I think we need to know where the parents are coming from and what their expectations of us are, and particularly what they've been told won't be possible. Because if they're believing that something isn't possible, why are they going to take our advice about interventions? On the other hand, if they are able to not only to brag about their child, but to talk about something your child could do today that they couldn't do three months ago. Have you looked at your phone? Have you looked at the videos from the last birthday party to see where your child was then and what they're doing now? getting helping parents to see that change is happening even if it doesn't happen as quickly as possible and i'm not pretending that having a child with a developmental impairment is easy but i think that we have too easily contributed to their pessimism um, because we're constantly doing therapy to fix what might not be fixable and missing the opportunity to celebrate what is happening like the other, the, the last quick thing I'll say is that I often talk to parents about helping kids survive childhood, uh, because when they get when they finish being children, uh, they may have abilities that we didn't recognize and didn't try to capitalize on, even if they can't do math or read very well. Um, Peter, I'm just going to try to maybe rephrase what Bernadette is saying as well, and I'm wondering yeah. around children who have minor. Um, developmental delays. Um, you know, is there a time when you would suggest that you focus more on quality of movement, etc., versus when there's a child with a um, a more significant um, physical disability where you might focus on function? That's sort of a little bit of a yeah. So that is there a difference in the different groups of children from your perspective? <coughs> Well, again, the complexity of that question um, involves what we mean by minor and more significant. It, uh, and, and in whose eyes are we making that judgment? Uh, you know, if we say to the parent, well, you think this is bad, you should have seen the kid I saw yesterday. That clearly, we don't, we don't say that, but that's, that's part of how we have often thought about severity. Um, I would like to know what it is the child wants to do. What is the child interested in? And can we help the child do those things to the best of their ability? And again, I relate, I try to relate everything that we talk about in our field to ordinary life. So the people in the audience who have kids who've had piano lessons uh, will understand what I'm talking about. Um, many of us thought our kids ought to learn the piano or the violin. And very, very occasionally the child loves it. Lots of times they don't. If they love it, they'll practice it. If they don't love it, uh, you know, at a certain point we have to <laughs> fish and cut bait um, and find something that they want to do. And I, my own view of the world in general is that helping kids to feel good about something and competent about it is really important, even if it's, you know, something we wouldn't particularly have done ourselves. I heard somebody say many years ago that when you have an interest, people take an interest in you. So it's again, this is much more about child development. And, and if you like, as Bernadette said about child mental health, 
uh, than it is about doing things nicely. Peter, speak to again. Sorry, I'm gonna throw a question out there because um, so much of what you talk about is mental, mental well-being, the anxiety, the, the joy, the, uh, the, as opposed to um, loving something versus hating a therapy or whatever. And the ICF, to me, has come very much from a physical health perspective. And I'm really struggling with, in my work, and embracing the ICF is where does the mental well-being sit in it? Is it a health condition? Is it a personal factor and depression and anxiety in that box? Or is it is the whole thing about physical health and mental well-being, or is it about physical well-being and mental health? So I have no answer, but it's a question of <laughs> how do you make the ICF capture? Yeah, you you raise you raise a really interesting point, which is that the ICF has, I think, been underappreciated, and where it has been embraced, it has often been in rehabilitation and disability which makes a lot of people think that it's just for that. And we would argue strenuously that that's not the case. I think that you could put, where I had CP and autism at the top, you could put d depression. And depression may be an organic disorder uh, related to brain chemicals or whatever it is, or it may be a personal factor based upon the fact that you don't you know you aren't able to do things as well as you'd like and you feel quote depressed about that uh, i think that the analysis of the situation allows us to say <clears throat> among other things what's going well what's going less well and is this a personal factor is it an organic issue um you know do we don't treat everybody with depression with uh uh, SSRIs, but if we are able to determine that there is a biochemical disorder, uh, we might think about chemical interventions as opposed to occupational therapy, uh, as opposed to you know social groups or whatever. But I think I think the ICF uh, uh, you know applies to everybody about everything. I think it can be um, I think you can integrate all the bits of people's lives in this way. We've got to the end of the time, but are you happy to take one more question? Yep. Hi, Peter. My name is Kim Wood and I'm an OT from the Ability Centre. Um, I've got a bit of a different question. Um, I've spent the past year working in Vietnam um, in disability and autism, and I was just wondering um, about that using the F words and how this has gone introducing it to developing countries when that spectrum on health is still very much in that medical model. And if you've introduced them, how's it gone? Or yeah, advice for working with different cultures and with our age and background. Great question. You said Vietnam, right? Um, I have a colleague, I don't know very well, who has been very interested in adapting. She translated and, and uh, adapted the F words. Um, and she is very much aware, she is a Vietnamese person, but with some understanding of, of how people in other parts of the world think about things. And she's very aware of the cultural uh, implications of uh, difference in disability in certainly in her country. Um, I think that we, we have never showed up at somebody's door and put this through the letterbox and say, you know, here's how you do it. When people hear about it and they're interested in it, we are more than happy to work with them to adapt, to uh, adapt, uh, to translate or to look at the back translation and so on. Um, <clears throat> but you raise a really important point, which is that these ideas are likely to be thought about very differently in different countries um, because of cultural variation in what disability means. Uh, and whether you feel you have any control over your life or whether this is the way God or, or, or Allah or anybody else, you know, views your life. Um, but as I said, we have 25 translations of these ideas, and these have all been done by people who asked us, people from Ethiopia and people from Somalia and people from Vietnam and people from many, you know, many uh, European countries. Um, so... All I can say is that these ideas um, present an alternative to the classical biomedical approach. 
Uh, I think in some countries like Vietnam, from what I understand from uh, my colleague, um, there's, there's a lot of work to be done because of classic entrenched ideas, uh, not only about cerebral palsy, but about disability in general. Um, so, you know, the same thing is true in India, by the way. Uh, and one of, my, one of our former PhD students did a very interesting study in which he interviewed 11 parents of children with cerebral palsy from, in uh, uh, Mangalore, where he's from in the southwest of India, and seven Canadian parents while he was with us in Canada, and uh, asked them to talk about their children with cerebral palsy, and then analyzed what they said using the ICF framework to place the context, to place the comments they made into the various uh, boxes. This is a published study. Um, and um, the parents in India almost entirely talked about body structure and function, rarely about activity, rarely about participation. The parents in Canada talked about their kids being engaged in community activities. And that's a function not of smarter Canadians, that's a function of the way in which the condition is acculturated in the medical community and about how people in different communities uh, are or are not aware of disability. But it's, it's a really fascinating uh, example of cultural difference without making any value judgment about it. Just, it's different. Okay, um, thanks, Peter. Um, sort of get down Thank there. you. <laughs> um, yeah, look, I think on behalf of everybody, it's been a really, um, interesting uh, conversation and um, really appreciate, I believe this is your third meeting with uh, Australia and we're hopefully the last one so you can relax now and um, yeah, look forward to um, seeing what new things come out from Chan uh, Canchild and yourself. Thank you again. Thank you. people can help us put away the chairs just really quickly but thank you everybody for coming and we'll